Since everyone loved the last time I covered a game with hasty development that used many of the same assets as its predecessor, I thought talking about Majora's Mask would be a good idea. No, I'm not going to talk about some dumb bug that's bothered me for a decade, though there is that one time I got softlocked. I'm here to make the controversial claim that Majora's Mask's themes and actual focus have been deeply overshadowed, and in turn, the reputation of the game has been… twisted. Not in a, people think it's bad, but it's great, or people think it's great, but it's bad kind of way, so much as centering a lot of attention on the parts that are unnerving to the detriment of the parts that are, for lack of a better term, cozy. Don't get me wrong, there's definitely a lot of, uh, weirdness. Majora's Mask is absolutely made to be unsettling, I wouldn't dare deny that, but in that light, the game doesn't have to be all sunshine and rainbows in order to be about community and friendships. And the gameplay doesn't have to be Animal Crossing in order to be congruent with that. If you've played any of the pre-Breath of the Wild Zelda games, particularly the N64 ones, Twilight Princess, and even to some degree the 2D ones, you know that the game is largely about finding how to enter dungeons and then completing said dungeons. You are, in effect, exploring spaces that equate to gigantic rooms in order to enter a series of smaller, connected rooms. Oh, and there's also mini-games. Be it in the overworld or dungeons, most of your interaction with the world is combat or some degree of puzzle solving. NPCs occasionally ask you for things, and series entries tend to have a trading chain in them and all that, but it's pretty inarguable that most of your time is spent elsewhere. Majora's Mask doesn't necessarily differ here to an extreme degree, but it does put emphasis on NPCs in ways other Zelda games don't. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about with Majora's Mask, but I don't think I've seen this brought up before. Yeah, sure, there's a freaky moon, and there's time travel shenanigans, and dream theory stuff, not to mention the convoluted fan theories, and, uh, this thing. But to me the weirdest part of the game is how invested it makes you in the people of Termina. It's not the intentionally eerie things or the strange that stick out to me, so much as the mold-breaking gameplay and narrative emphasis. It's the way Majora's Mask was especially centered on community, friendship, and interpersonal connections. More than the moon, the game focuses on the people within its growing shadow. Majora's Mask is about the people of Termina. What better place to start digging in than with the title sequence? Sure, it starts with the iconic whoosh. And the creepy mask man laugh. <laughs> and ends with a pan up to the scary moon and a tone shift. but the majority of the sequence is calm vibing. In fact, there's two iterations, one of which showing Link all around the game world, which I always forget about, and the other, that's more to my point, solely centered on Link sitting places and watching the life of Clocktown play out. Link is hanging out, he's just around, and people are talking and going about their lives and having their routines. If you want proof that the daily lives of NPCs were a major focus for the developers, look no further than an interview in Nintendo Power issue 134. It's also the issue with the weird Kirby page, so that's cool. In an interview with Eiji Aonuma, Shigeru Miyamoto, and Takashi Tezuka, we get a glimpse into the developer intent and the motivations for even making this game. In this game, we wanted to give more insight into some of the minor characters found in Ocarina of Time. We were able to give gamers a better look at old characters and develop new characters at the same time. When asked the somewhat specific question of if there was anything the team was unable to accomplish with Ocarina of Time that they were making up for with Majora's Mask, Miyamoto highlighted the three-day interval system and how it allowed players to experience the lives of the characters. 
We'll come back to this interview later, but for now let's follow the story of a formerly minor character to illustrate how Majora's Mask took a new direction, and follow that up with discussing how their endeavors to make a different kind of game panned out. Let's do a bit of story time. Anju is one of the more complex characters in the game. Real quick, I want to preempt this by saying she is not typical of the NPCs, but rather shows the upper limit of complexity. Anju the Innkeeper is set to be married on an important day for Termina, the first day of Clock Town's festival, now a day that has gone from important to urgent, the day of the moon's crash into Termina. She spends the final three days pushing away a sense of dread, not fueled by the existential threat, but by her upcoming wedding day. Her fiancé, Café, vanished a month ago, and her hope dwindles the closer time gets to the wedding day. But on the first of the final days, after a month without a word, she receives a letter from Café. Several characters touch this story, and Link is one of them. If he speaks to Anju while wearing a mask signifying he's looking for Café, she promises to meet Link in the kitchen at 11.30 on the first of final nights to discuss what she knows. Strange, isn't it, getting a letter from a missing person? She hands him a letter to deliver. After all, if she got one from him, maybe she can send one. And Link can give it to the, uh, toilet ghost. Oh, Yay! oh well, reset the timeline. Link delivers the letter to a post box so it will go out tomorrow. The second day, always rainy, she takes a midday walk hoping to find Café. She walks from the inn to the back alley laundry pool and sits on the bench, hoping to catch a glimpse of her beloved, hoping to find and confront him. Her hope is dwindling and the moon is getting closer. And that's only part of her half of the story. Café's events intertwine. Café the Missing Man was transformed into a child after a night out at the milk bar with the fellows? Look, I never denied this game was weird, and here's one reason. In the first moments of the final three days, he walks to the mailbox, delivering a letter Anju will receive. Link, should he walk up to him, is fully unable to talk to him. He wears the Keaton mask, a gift from his childhood, fitting, again, in this regressed form. If Link follows the postman as he delivers the letter, he can sneak into Café's hideout and confront him the way Anju could not. When Link meets him in his hideout, he has already quickly read Anju's letter and trusts Link to help him. He reveals the true reason he went missing, not that he was cursed to take the form of a child, but that he cannot face Anju having lost his wedding mask to a thief. He has been surveilling the curiosity shop, watching for the thief who stole his wedding mask. If Link stops the bomb lady from being robbed, Sakon the thief will not go to the curiosity shop, and in turn, Café will have no leads. This is, um, also the case if Link commits criminal justice, and Sakon gets blown up. Yeah, so I always forget this is the one Zelda where you can fully kill a human character. And mind you, he is legit dead, like he doesn't show up in the places he normally does should you do this. And if Link does intervene... There's always another cycle of the final days to try again. There are moments Link can change the fate of many characters, though few like this. In another game, such fail states would be too punishing, but because one can always start the cycle again, there's always another opportunity to get things right. This side story demonstrates a different intent with Majora's Mask. It's a sign of the involvement Link can have with a character that was once only known as Cuckoo Lady. In general, the Zelda series has formulaic elements to it just as much as changes between entries. Going from Ocarina of Time to Majora's Mask, the biggest distinction, beyond setting, of course, is the way time is used in the game, with the gradual progression of time being a central mechanic. The design philosophy hasn't so much shifted into something new as it has refocused. A new game with a new premise, new way of navigating time, and a new emphasis on NPCs. But the same Link. Literally the same one, and that's not common for these games. Relatedly, I personally don't pay much heed to the timeline theories even if Nintendo republishes them post-fact, but that's a tangent I'll avoid. 
point being the worlds are not often in continuity with each other or the story of the same Link on several journeys. Rather, the continuity of Zelda hinges more on shared elements. For instance, when it comes to setting, many games have an equivalent to a castle town, a Zora domain, a Goron city, a Kakariko village, a forest town of some kind, and so on. Windfall Island in Wind Waker is kind of in a hybrid position, but the music theme is a reworked Kakariko theme, so I'll call it that game's Kakariko village. Majora's Mask's setting is a place called Termina, and it deviates from the formula. I don't like that that rhymed. Clock Town is the literal center of this game. While the numbers of other towns in a given Zelda game title differ from game to game, usually there's more than one. In Majora's Mask, there's two functional smaller towns, and then there's everywhere else. Contrast this with Ocarina of Time, where Hyrule Castle may be somewhat centrally located on the map, but there's a lot more initially functioning towns. Ocarina's post-time skip towns are in disarray, but they start out as relatively thriving communities that split the NPCs between a fair few places. In OOT, we have the Kokiri Village, Kakariko Village, the Goron City, Hyrule Castle Town, and Zora Domain, with a fair few places having scattered NPCs. Being generous, we could even count the ranch, but there's three NPCs there total, not counting livestock. For the sake of consistency, I'll not count the Gerudo Fortress because it's a sneaking section, much like I won't count the Deku Palace. In Majora's Mask, there is no equivalent to Kakariko Village, and in terms of the cardinal directions, two of the four don't even have a town. And the Gorons are in a bad way unless you beat the temple boss. <laughs> You can see how the density of things is a bit different. In turn, Clock Town ends up more tightly packed with distinct NPCs than either OOT's Castle Town or Kakariko, which is that game's post time skip hub. One more thing to note is the emphasis on distinct characters. In Ocarina, there are plenty of friendly NPCs in the Zora Domain and Goron City, but they're often only distinguished by their one line of dialogue. Non Hylian NPCs tend to be non distinct, using the same model as one another. The Kokiri have at least three unique characters and a lot of siblings. While there's still generic non-Hylians, there's more unique ones too, and in general, more characters have a unique look. Point being, Majora's Mask cares more about fleshing out the NPCs on a story and visual level. Anju was born of the desire to flesh out a character formerly known as the Cuckoo Lady after all. On the topic of density again, if you want to make the argument that Clock Town looks physically empty of people, you might then expect the counter-argument to be one of game limitations or representational flexibility like the Elder Scrolls games. But there's actually a reason explicitly stated in-game. If you walk in on the council meeting at Merdotor's office, the construction man Muto and the head guardsman Vixen are arguing over evacuation protocol and openly note that the town is empty compared to normal. Now, factually, this game was doing what it could handle, and this is an excuse, quote-unquote, in that sense, but I think it's funny they acknowledge it. Note that, in that example, the characters all had names. In Ocarina of Time, they wouldn't have. Granted, not everyone got one. The postman is just the postman, not Boingle, or whatever they'd call him. In terms of the world space, being brief with comparison to Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, and Skyward Sword, two of those games are about people separated by islands. Suffice to say the NPCs are fairly spread out, and those, all the same, there are hubs in each of those games, with only maybe Skyloft being as central as Clock Town. Twilight Princess offers up both several communities and a bustling castle town, but it's worth noting that a lot of the NPCs are designed to be crowd filler, which does serve making Hyrule Castle Town feel more alive, but they're not people you can become familiar with. Become familiar is an important framing here, by the way, because narratively, Link is absolutely an outsider. Link is framed as an outsider, coming to Termina from elsewhere. The game starts in a formless forest that could be anywhere, and it is only through a series of impossible transitions that Link enters Termina, not through a mountain pass or via a boat or anything like that, but through a contorted tunnel passage that leads to the underbelly of the clock tower. For a city that's allegedly packed to the brim with tourists during the festival, I imagine this isn't the normal travel route. Now, there's little mention of Link being from outside this world from the people who inhabit it. In fact, there are often instances of being mistaken for someone else, of being immediately trusted with tasks, of swiftly, if unintentionally, belonging. The transformation masks demonstrate this. 
Metaphorically, one could call the transformation masks a form of becoming part of communities, adopting roles, even. I won't make this some weird analysis of the importance of masks and presenting feelings or masking them or whatever, I'm genuinely not certain the themes cut that deep. There is, however, something to be said about how the transformation masks are the product of curses and involved some kind of merging with the souls of the departed and being falsely recognized as a deceased member of the community, at least in the cases of the Zora and Goron masks. Being entirely literal, you are granted these masks by ghosts in order to take their form and accomplish what they failed to do. Solving people's problems, resolving regrets, that's a lot of what you do in Termina. And I guess video games in general, but either way, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little. Link is from another place, and Termina might not even be real, and it might all be a dream. If we feel the need to have a diegetic conceit for why the Cuckoo Lady and Anju are different people who look identical, a dream world is a decent one to go for. I can't prove or disprove that theory, and I even prefer it over all the linked timeline ones. One difficulty for Majora's Mask is that it explicitly ties itself to Ocarina of Time in a way that other Zelda games simply do not. We don't need to come up with a reason why Beetle is in a bunch of games, we don't need to justify the archetypes of characters being present elsewhere. Guru Guru and Malon are in the Game Boy Advance games, but that doesn't mean something. Characters get reused in this series without necessarily being the same person. For a game about being an outsider, too many people would be familiar to Link if these were the same people. Too many people would be outsiders. There's simply too much overlap for it to be the same people unless Hyrule's Hylian regions are ghost towns now. So I'm going to work with the premise that this is neither a dream nor are these the same people. In light of that, it is a bit odd for Aonuma, Tezuka, and Miyamoto to frame the game around getting to know these minor characters. They can't be the same ones. And that's why I advocate we drop the question of dream theories and who these people are, and just look at the game in a bit more isolation when it comes to the characters. The game is still very much about getting to know these people, and true to Zelda fashion, at least of the era, the way you interact with the world is deeply connected to the passage of time. Nothing represents getting to know people, the familiarity and subsequent interactivity, better than the way the game keeps track of it all, the Bomber's Notebook. The Notebook is integral to playing Majora's Mask because it tracks the events of the three days. It charts out the lives of some major minor characters. keeping note of moments of potential interaction. So let's look into the two things the notebook tracks, schedules and interaction. A core conceit of Majora's Mask is the advancement of time. The game takes place over three days that repeat when you play the Song of Time. These days, it turns out, are highly structured. In turn, the NPCs have routines that are entirely rigid. By contrast, in Ocarina of Time, the time of day only progressed outside of towns, and even then, there aren't schedules so much as binary world states of day and night. People don't travel from place to place, and indeed hardly move aside from patrol routes. Daytime, this NPC is standing here, nighttime, he's over there, that sort of thing. Now, one fun thing about this that sort of proves how hard-coded the schedules are is that if you play the song that slows down the flow of time, the NPCs move slower in order to be able to be in the right places at the right times of day. They also can't be obstructed. It's mechanical, like a... Uh like a clock. Hmm. In the Nintendo Power interview, Miyamoto was asked how the limited game time shaped the gameplay experience, to which he responded, The game world is a small garden, and the player must explore everything in the garden to experience the game. It is the same idea that is behind all Mario and Zelda games. But in Majora's Mask, we limited the time span to three days so that players would have to learn everything that happens in the world during that time. To save the world, they must know where and when everything happens. 
Answering a question about what the game accomplishes that Ocarina failed to, Miyamoto said, Yes, in fact that's why we decided to base the game on three-day intervals. This allows gamers to see characters as they go through their daily routines in more detail. That said, I won't make the argument that these are deeply fleshed out days, or that moment to moment there is always something going on for each individual NPC. There are, however, always moving parts of this clock. There's always somewhere to be, a place to spend time. Granted, I'm also not going to argue that the game doesn't waste your time. More than a few events are keyed to times that are hours away from dawn or dusk, the two hours you can skip to. And while that's fine for some, for others there's a very narrow window, so you don't want to be caught out doing something else and miss it and have to repeat the cycle again. It can be... frustrating. The developers, or at least somebody, seem to agree with me because the 3DS remake lets you skip to more precise times, which really reduces the headache. It should be noted that living in PCs with schedules was a big thing back in the day and something that a game like Oblivion was marketed on. Majora's Mask was, in its era, not the norm. I don't want us to lose sight of how games used to just be atemporal or have a binary day-night, and that NPCs often did not move from their place or had very basic patrol routes. This schedule and routine thing is big for making these characters feel more… real. They're still relatively simple, but there's three days of being around them. Though as a point of clarity, there are of course moments of transition where people just jump in location and stuff. Businesses are closed at certain hours until the next day, and yeah, you don't watch a shopkeeper walk to their store in the morning from some static apartment location and clock town lacks for residences. The place isn't the same kind of lived in as a given Bethesda game, sure, but even the emphasis on routine sets us apart from other Zelda games. The world is a moving one we gradually become familiar with, as we know its routines. But knowing schedules can only take you so far, observing can only take us so far. The other side of things is interaction and changing events. The Bomber's Notebook is part scheduling device, part journal, but it's not quite the same as an in-game quest log where things simply get crossed off and you're done with them. Because of the whole time travel thing, the troubles that the people in your journal get into reset. You may keep the reward, but technically on each repeat of the cycle, that old lady is getting robbed. And some of the interactions have cause and effect chains that make it important to mark down the event for future manipulation. As noted in my story example, if the bomb lady gets robbed, then the bomb store can't sell bomb bags because it doesn't have them. But if Link prevents the robbery, Cafe cannot continue his story because he never gets a lead on the thief. One key thing to remember here is that this is an old-school Zelda game, which means that it has that Metroidvania-esque condition where you run into problems you can't solve till you have a later piece of equipment or access to another area. This spills into the interactions in that just because you found a character doesn't mean you can solve their trouble right away. The most complex event chain is discoverable on the moment you get the bomber's notebook, but you won't have the means to actually solve the trouble until you're near the end of the game and can access the Akana region more fully. That said, sometimes a trouble isn't even about having an in-depth task to solve. Sometimes there's just one trouble-related interaction for a character, and sometimes there's characters who don't get marked down. The Rosa sisters are an example of where this merges with general scheduling and interaction. You can see them wandering the hotel outside their trouble-solving time slot, and you can talk to them. They do only have that one event, but they don't exist solely during said event. Relatedly, I've always found it a bit curious that there are a few masks with very limited applications or just a singular use. Here's a chart of the masks that are used to get one reward and that's it. To be fair though, the Kamaro Mask, the Scent Mask, and the Bremen Mask may not have many uses, but they do allow Link to do a fun new thing. Dance, or sniff out mushrooms, or march, respectively. I don't think the masks should be understood as solely a problem-solving tool. They're fun, they're, as masks are meant to be, expressive. Also, side note, I think this Star Fox reference should be a speedrun category, Star Fox percent, if you will. We as the player are set up not only to understand the world in its motions, but how to change the movement, how to affect events. 
We feel our impact on the community. We see what happens when we don't act. We come to the ranch on the third day, having not resolved the trouble on the first, and we see Romani in a stupor and Kremia crying in the barn. We change the course of this world by taking part in it, even if we're not fully part of it. Okay, so maybe it's slightly eerie being a time traveler who just, like, plots out someone's schedule over three days, then goes back to witness the events play out again, looking for paths of divergence that lead them to a sense of resolution, but, uh... Candidly, when considered in conjunction with the way populations are dispersed in Zelda games from the prior section, this might also have something to do with why Terrytown was the only place in Breath of the Wild I really ended up caring about, and the only part of the OST that pops into my head besides the stable music, for that matter. It's one of the places where you feel a genuine impact in a gradual way, rather than just, oh, you solved the local existential threat. Overall, there's a lot of emphasis placed on knowing routines, on familiarity. The Bomber's Notebook is a tool intended to help the player keep track, but it isn't comprehensive, possibly because that would trivialize learning the game or overcomplicate the notebook itself. This is as good a time as any to mention that the 3DS version changed the notebook and made some other controversial choices which have been documented in a video I'll link here. I've played both versions and I think the fact that there are changes at all is worth mentioning. It's interesting to try and determine the delineations of what does and does not get into the notebook, and that's one big change with the 3DS version. Not every iconic or memorable character gets an entry. Tingle, as grotesque and fascinating as he is, does not have an associated trouble, so despite his masterfully crafted face, he doesn't appear in the notebook. One person I'm sure isn't in the journal for a reason, despite being intertwined with many time-sensitive events, is Sakon the Thief. Naturally, he doesn't have troubles we solve, he's the source of trouble. There's another big question we're pulled to when considering schedules and interaction. Can the perfect timeline exist? Can Link do everything that needs doing in the three days, big and small, save Clocktown, and right the despair of everyone in Termina in one cycle? No. There's not enough time and there are mutually exclusive moments. Meeting Anju at the inn at 11.30 and stopping the old lady from being robbed at midnight cannot happen in the same cycle. And even if they did, the success of that robbery is, for the third time, necessary for Cafe to find a lead and result in the positive conclusion of the quest. And on that note, it bears mention that you can never go far enough back in time to stop people from getting hurt. The resets, the world saved, by the time it all happens, certain characters are already dead. The timeline is always dark. Which leads us to one last thing. Is this actually the scary Zelda? There is something to the argument that this game is eerie, scary, unsettling. It has a lot of those elements, but so does Ocarina of Time. Sure, the world gets darker as Ganondorf takes over and there's a notable shift, punctuated by the destruction of Hyrule Castle Town, but the world isn't particularly safe in the child era. The horror of Ocarina of Time is pretty substantial. It starts with a nightmare, a fitful dream that's really a vision of the future. The first dungeon ends with the tree you were hoping to save dying as he gives you his final words. A tree dies in your arms, metaphorically. And then Link doesn't even have the decency to, like, lore walk away. Come on, that's just rude. As a kid, I remember somehow convoluting the order of gameplay doing the fire and water temples before the forest one just because of how unnerved the music of the forest one made me feel. I then also tried to do as much of the spirit temple as I could before doing the shadow one. There's less of a cosmic dread, but the tone isn't exactly... light. Everywhere Link goes, Ganondorf is ahead of him, and has cursed or in some way doomed the people of the land. 
As for aesthetic horror, Ocarina of Time has a whole graveyard dungeon, too if you count the well. The forest temple has a whole portrait ghost theme. Hyrule Field at Night just has a ceaseless wave of undead monsters come after you. What the- Okay, forget everything I said. The scariest thing in OOT is the dread of clicking the wrong thing every time the owl asks you if you understood what he said and repeating the dialogue again. Except, wait, there's a game that taught me they aren't monsters. The land where the dead still walk, Ikana, a cursed land, is also a place where you still interact with characters. You fight them, yeah, but you also see a humanized side of the king and his two underlings. <laughs> The Garo are spirits of revenge stalking the land with bloodlusts, but they also talk to you. The Redead do a little dance if you wear the right mask. The Gibdo are pacified by music and trade with you. I don't say all this to undercut the scares or to say, if you didn't find this wholesome, you're wrong, because again, very clearly, the game is going for spooky, eerie things. One could even argue that the horror hits harder, contrasts deeper in a world where we also become familiar with the people and the places that aren't hostile. That said, there are other definitions and contributors to horror and being scary. The three-day schedule system, which allows for a slice of life to even look into, is also quite naturally a source of anxiety for a lot of players. And it's not just a loose, vague timer. The existential threat quite literally looms above you. The moon is very real. In that light, it probably sounds like a joke to call the game cozy. I merely want to take the opportunity to look at Majora's Mask's horror in context. I want to set it in contrast with both the general history of horror elements as demonstrated with Ocarina of Time and against its own focus on a living world. Yes, it's very there, and the game does get dark, but it is fundamentally preoccupied also with sharing the stories and lives of the inhabitants of Termina. Along with that, arguing which game is darker isn't my intent either. I think one could say it's rather dark that the timeline where the world is saved doesn't stop the suffering from having happened in the first place, that the people of Termina still get a taste of all the curses, where Hyrule effectively dodges Ganondorf's reign entirely. I mean the tree still dies and the Goron rock market crashes for like a week, but whatever. Besides, Jacob Geller already covered darkness. Then again, you can commit criminal justice, so who knows. I started the core of this discussion by bringing in the title sequence, how it starts spooky and ends spooky, but the bulk of the middle is calm, relaxed, and centered on people watching. In some sense, I think this captures the game itself rather well and provides us with a lens into how the impression of the game as the spooky one really came about. In an interesting way, one can look at Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask as both being games that play with time. Ocarina takes a very macro approach. You go between childhood and adulthood, a seven year jump back and forth. Majora has, in turn, a very micro approach, just three days. This, I'd argue, is reflected also in how interpersonal the games are. Majora's micro focus lets you really get to know the lives of the people in it. The world changes on a small scale each day. Ocarina has a large before and after sort of approach. Link meets most of the sages before he can even time travel, but very few characters grow up with him in that game. 
Most people link meats in childhood are adults to begin with or ageless beings. The only people who really change with time are Malin, Zelda, and Rudo. When people talk about Majora's Mask, I tend to see a heavy, heavy skew towards the eerie, the creepy, the unsettling things, and I will say it is earned. It has a reputation for being darker than Ocarina of Time that I think undersells the horror within OOT while also undercutting the clearly intended idea of familiarity and community present in Majora's Mask. And to be fair, the mask transformations, the mask guys laugh, the undead, and the default state of decay on entering the world outside Clock Town, those all leave quite an impression. The moon is creepy and iconic, and I'm not denying that. I just want to present the other side of this game because it rarely seems to have its moment. The reason I started the whole video with that weird moment of the masked child asking you if your friends were real was that it unexpectedly captures a big part of the game. It is eerie, it is strange, and it is something you question. And it's not just eerie for the sake of eerie. The use of the word friends carries weight. Hi, that one took a while to make compared to my expectations. Next time is probably something more mm, esoteric. Massive thanks and a heartfelt endorsement go out to Skyhoppers, who did a script read for this video and a voice read for the developer interviews. He is the closest thing I have to a personal YouTube rival and got into the essay game around the time I started my channel, which makes unhealthily comparing myself and my content to his a recurring ordeal. And so what I'm saying is pick a side. No, really. Great channel, cool person. You'll love his stuff if you enjoyed this video. He makes the kind of stuff I rewatch, so consider that my stance on quality. And of course a big thanks goes out to patrons. Wait, uh, actually quick note on that, Patreon has been, uh, going through it, and they've decided to make another genius brain decision and literally don't even call patrons patrons anymore? I'm still going to. In alphabetical order, because the world isn't fair, special mention goes to Jan Orsa, Defender, Freddy, Galactic Beyond, Le Sing Afame, Mark Soto, Michael Kelly, Nick, Niche Smonker, Sipa Turnipsy, and Queen Naked Molerat. That's all for now. I'm too lazy to credit the music this time, but it's all from OOT or Majora anyhow. Uh, bye. <laughs>